Hello? Okay, hi, I'm Gary Hoover. Welcome. Uh, I want to first of all thank South by Southwest for um, uh, allowing me the time to talk about these things that I think are so important. And uh, there's a hashtag up here, Mexico Hoover, Mexico Hoover, Mexico Hoover. Um, uh, for this session, and the whole Latin American track has a hashtag SXSWLATAM. South by Southwest LATAM, Latin America. And I want to hand out, um, I think I got way too many to go around, so if you'll pass my cards back, you can get a brand new one, my friend. <laughs> and you can pass those back, sure. I can just. And uh, you want to take extras or something, there are stacks of them up here. Um, email me anytime you want. I've been around Austin for a long time. Uh, how many of you don't know anything about me? Uh, okay, then I guess me excuse to tell you a little. I'll, I'll tell you a, a few things. Um, I moved to Austin 28 years ago to start my first company. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I have started four companies. Uh, the first one uh, was the first book superstore open in Northwest Austin in September of 1982. And that, seven years later, a venture capitalist helped us finance it, as other parties do, started with angels. And when it was seven years old, it was sold to Barnes & Noble for like $40 million. And that was their entry into the big bookstore business. So that was child number one. And then child number two, I, and every business I started, I planned on doing my whole life. It just didn't work out that way. The first one, the venture capitalist fired me and sold the company. Although I'm really glad it ended up in the hands of uh, Barnes & Noble, unlike my friend Tom Borders, whose great chain ended up badly managed and as you know went bankrupt. I was in there. I've got uh, friends picking up fixtures today. I collect books. I live in a library. I have 50,000 books in my house. I'll come back to that. Venture number two, as you'll know in a second, I'm really interested in business. So I started a company that became Hoovers.com. I didn't name it after myself, but actually after I was out of regular management, I was still on the board, but not running it. My friends renamed it Hoovers. It went public and it sold out in 2003 to Dun & Bradstreet, like I don't know, 117 million or something. And, and uh, it's uh, among the biggest providers of information about companies on the internet. And you go to hoovers.com and it's a subscription service and it's global now. Still has five, six hundred employees here in Austin. Does about 125 million a year in revenue on the subscription model. And what we tried every model. We tried licensing our data and, you know, free, freemium kind of a model and uh, advertising supported uh, before the 1999.com bust. Then my third uh, idea, I love to travel, as you're also going to hear a little about in a minute. And, um, I started a thing called Travel Fest Superstore. It's the first true travel superstore in America. There are people dabbling with it in England. Uh, there wasn't really anything in the United States. And um, got it up and going. It was actually very, customers loved it. It was books, luggage, maps, second best map and travel book store in America, and, uh, and tickets and reservations. And we're doing about 30 million out of three little stores, two in Austin, one in Houston. And uh, airlines stopped paying commissions on airline tickets. And so my efforts to save it, I, I stopped taking a paycheck for a long time. Time, six to 12 months, I uh, borrowed a million dollars against a big old house on Lake Austin that I'd bought with the proceeds from, from Bookstop and everything, what I hadn't given to the University of Chicago where I went to college. Uh, and, um, and I couldn't save it. I ended up, you know, uh, losing all the money I made on the first two. You know, when, when uh, Hoover sold for $117 million, I got $60,000, all of which I owed to other people. So I went a million dollars into that trying to save it. Uh, was not able to. Was, we didn't, never went bankrupt, neither the company nor myself, because I don't think that's really playing cricket, if you can at all avoid it. Uh, then uh, the fourth child kind of started over, was lucky to found a find an old Catholic school that was sitting there vacant that would hold all my books, because I didn't part with the books. I could part with the house and the boat and, you know, the cash, <laughs> I guess. Anyhow, and um, so uh, then I dreamed up the idea of the first for-profit chain of museums and visited 400 museums worldwide and uh, raised half the money, raised about seven million, need another six to get it done, hit the recession in 08 and couldn't finish that one. I keep a list of ideas, my little tablet in my pocket. This one just went in the other day. Tablet number 172, just been doing that the last 12 years and I have about 150 business ideas um, that are in my active list. I mainly teach entrepreneurship now. Last year I was the entrepreneur in residence at the University of Texas at Austin at the McCombs Business School. I saw about 500 business plans, judge business plan competitions, um, 
I uh, worked one-on-one -on -one with about 200 students on their ideas, half from the business school, half from outside. I actually am an advocate more of liberal arts education than a business education, but they all play a role. And, uh, and now I've actually started my own little Hoover Academy, and I give uh, independent courses uh, uh, on uh, entrepreneurship at the Tech Ranch, which is a wonderful uh, for-profit incubator here in Austin, a very entrepreneurial thing itself, and I'm glad to have Kevin Coyne, the founder, in, in the audience here, who is also a great believer in Latin America, and has spent a lot made his first dollar ever made in Mexico and uh, now is extremely active in Chile. And um, so that's me, <laughs> as fast as I could get through that. Um, and let me go back to my past, to set a basis for all that madness. I grew up in the General Motors factory town, Anderson, Indiana. 60,000 people worked there, lived there. 27,000 worked at General Motors. And so it was a big deal, you know? And I'm in the classroom, the teachers are talking about leaders, leadership styles. Um, uh, strategies, how people made decisions, you know, kings and queens of Europe, presidents, generals and colonels, civil war, revolutionary war, World War I, World War II, and I thought, oh, that's real cool. I'm really fascinated by these leaders, how they think, um, how they uh, act, uh, uh, what, what makes people follow them, and their strategies. Do they have strategies that worked or strategies that didn't work, you know, like Mr. Hitler's strategy didn't really work out even for him that well. and. Um, and Mr. Franklin Delano Roosevelt's strategy, and Winston Churchill's was a little better. Um, so I, I was fascinated by it, but I want to know what about General Motors? When you're in a town and 27,000 people work there in a town of 60,000, well, what are they, um, uh, who, who are their leaders? And I asked the teachers, tell me about General Motors. They said they make Chevrolet, Pontiac, Buick, Oldsmobile, Cadillac, GMC, truck, frigid air appliances. I, I know all that. I said, who started it? Why did they start it? Who runs it today? Are they smart people or are they stupid people? Nobody can answer my questions. They're all like, oh, silly kid, let's get back to the lesson plan here, you know? And it's driving me nuts. And I'm in a newsstand with my family. My sister's looking at the horse and dog magazines. My brother's looking at the uh, car and plane magazines. And I see one called Fortune, a business magazine. And every spring or early summer, they do a list of 500 biggest companies in America. Number one was General Motors, 50% bigger than any other company on earth, more profitable than any other company on earth. and. Um, and, and there were 499 other big outfits like that. And I said, wow, somebody does care about all this big business. and Because nobody seemed to understand how it works. And I still believe that's true with a big share of our population. So I became interested. I, I went running and my parents said, you've got to get me a subscription to this magazine. This is the coolest thing I've ever seen. I'm like, oh, you weird kid. You know, what are we going to do with you? Why don't you play basketball like a normal Indiana kid? Anyway, I got my subscription. And two months later, I entered the seventh grade. And when I got the new fortune and I went, home and I went through all 500 companies. I went down to the library and the stock brokerage office. It was pre, you know, internet, pre-Hoovers. And, and uh, you know, uh, water, uh, learned about all 500 companies. And last spring when the new issue, 500 issue came out, it was a 48th year in a row that I've grabbed it out of my mailbox and run in my room and gone down through all 500 companies. Say so who's up, who's down. The bottom line is I became fascinated with enterprises, with people working together to achieve a higher goal, to achieve something they couldn't achieve working on their own. And so I'm talking about uh, General Motors, I'm talking about the four startups that I did, I'm talking about Barnes and Noble and Borders, I'm talking about South by Southwest, um, but also the nonprofit world. And in fact, of all the corporations that I, my life has been touched by, I worked on Wall Street, I studied economics at the University of Chicago, I worked on Wall Street and I worked for two giant retail companies, so three big guys, four of my own startups. Of all the corporations I've been touched by the best run one is the University of Chicago. If I look at their leadership, their consistency of leadership, the clarity of vision of their board of directors, and their ability to look out beyond six months or a year, they are, when Stanford and everybody else are laying off people, they're hiring people. They're on an aggressive, right through the recession, hiring because the president said, look, this is a great time to hire faculty. And the only reason you can do that is because you've got a board of trustees that's looking 20 years out instead of 20 weeks. In any case, so enterprises of all types, and I've been involved in a lot of nonprofits and social entrepreneurship and encourage all that. And really my life is about studying them, learning about them. Some of my 50,000 books are about business history and all that. From all that, I have come up with a list of things that I think are the key things for success. And if you go to Hoover's World, that's on the, on the card there, and you click back to some of the older posts, my entire book I wrote is up there, talk about different parts of the world, all the issues, and on the back of the card that I gave you are my eight key points. And those of you who didn't get a card, you can pick one up at, at the end. Um, I'm not going to go through those eight points today, that's not why I'm here, but I'm going to touch on uh, three general ideas before I get into Mexico. The first thing 
is that studying all those enterprises and really having, because I've gone back and now studied back to the Medici and all the great European, entre, you know, entrepreneurship and business going way, way back, and have come to the conclusion that nothing that matters in business is new. Techniques are new, whether you use Twitter or billboards or a, a daily broadsheet in Philadelphia in 1814 to advertise yourself, that changes. But the basics don't change. And the most important basic is to understand that entrepreneurship and business are about people. I have just, after spending a year in the business school and about half my time with engineering, computer science students and everything, I just meet so many people that think that entrepreneurship is about money, uh, about wealth creation or believe that entrepreneurship is about technology and neither is the case and, and I think it's a safe bet most of you are technologists broadly defined in one sense or another so go back and study the history see where it all came from study the greatest technological enterprise built in the history of the world so far was IBM there's a company that got big, stayed big and powerful for a long period of time. It's still too early to judge a Google or a YouTube or some of those other cases. Uh, Apple is, give them another 20 years and I'll feel pretty good about that. I feel pretty good already. But, uh, um, but if you look at IBM, they were creating the mainframe computer in the 1940s, 1950s. But it was really created by a company called Univac out of Philadelphia. And uh, Eckert and Motchley, two scientists, Univac brought them out. The old Remington Rand uh, office equipment company bought them out. And at one point, I think it was, I think it was the fall of 1953, there had been like 10 mainframe computers installed worldwide, and six of them were Univacs. And a bunch of other people, General Electric, RCA, the old National Cash Register, uh, electronics companies, guys like Raytheon, you know, uh, defense companies. Everybody saw, oh, there's a future in computers. IBM was really built, it wasn't founded, but it was really built by a man named Thomas Watson Sr. Thomas Watson Sr. was not a technologist. He was a salesman. He learned to sell cash registers at the great National Cash Register Company. All his competitors were mainly run by pure technologists. So when it came out with these um, mainframes, all the, all the, there were eight major companies through most of the era of the mainframe. Uh, uh, they, all the other companies said, we need a faster CPU. Because they were computer geeks, you know? It's just like car guys coming from Indiana and Detroit area, all that. The, um, some of them are just obsessed with the engines. And they say, well, you know, whether it has a GPS, or whether it has a Bluetooth, or whether it has an iPod plug, you know, ah, I don't care about that. That's, I'm a car guy. I love engines. Faster, faster, bigger, bigger. So all these computer guys, faster CPUs. Watson, the salesman, went out and talked to all his customers, and they said, no, the bottleneck in our, whether we can use a computer or not, because, you know, they're all coming off old hand-punched calculators, was we need a faster printer. That's the bottleneck. And so he had IBM, and he believed in research, and he believed in technology. They built one of the greatest R&D you know, uh, systems, a global one, with France and everything involved, as well as upstate New York. And, and, but, but he said, you guys working on technology, build us a faster printer. And they invented that high-speed band printer, a huge part of their success. Within a year, IBM was selling 60% of all the mainframes sold in the world, and they maintained that position for over 20 years, all off the momentum of that. And while they had the big research department, their their department that was uh, focused on what comes next was not future technology. It was called the future demands department. It's like go out and talk to the customers and ask them what they want. And, and it's all about people. Entrepreneurship, enterprise, to be successful is about putting people first. And then how can that technology serve those people? How can that capital serve those people? So one overarching idea. Second thing, I've already touched on it, history. Uh, the, there's no MBA program in the United States that requires you take business history. That cost our society, I believe, I say billions of dollars, I bet you it's, it's more like uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. The, the Europeans are much more attuned to their own history. Uh, the Japanese have a longer term perspective. Sometimes our short term view of the world and everything that really matters happened last year or will happen next year. One of my buddies, a uh, person I mentor, a dear friend of mine, he's now doing his first startup in Singapore, graduated from UT Austin. He emailed me and once said, well, I want to learn about the future and I am very focused on the future. He said, well, what could I read? And I named some books. He said, well, those are great, but what blogs? He said, I like to get ideas from blogs. I said, okay, good. I write one. I said, um, send me your 10 favorite blogs from which you learn about the future. He sent them to me. I looked at him. I emailed him back. I said, James, none of these talk about the future. He said, what do you mean? He said, they talk about the iPad 3 when it's coming out and iPhone 5. And I said, first of all, they're all talking about six months from now which is too late for me to have a huge impact on. And then the other thing, I mean, I gotta be further out 10, 20 years to really see the future that matters and that I can affect. And then the other thing is, um, not one of those blogs ever mentioned 1990, 1980, 1970. You absolutely cannot know where you're going if you don't know where you're coming from. 
The vast majority of change in our lives follow patterns. It goes linearly up, exponentially up, it goes down, it can do a sine wave. And until you put the dots down for 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, for the big things, the things that are changing the world, you're not, obviously some of the curves are a little shorter. You've got to graph your, your uh, YouTube usage on a shorter term. But I can assure you, if you take the graph of the rise of radio, the rise of television, the rise of cable TV, all those, you know, the Christensen, all those dudes write all those books about them. So one thing is a sense of history. And then the other general idea, the last one, is geography. Uh, they say the world is all one click away. Place doesn't matter anymore. Or you will see that being said. It's true, the world is one click away. But every person on earth grew up somewhere. Every person on earth lives somewhere. And we are shaped by it. Growing up in Indiana, I grew up with basketball and auto racing. Now, the auto racing season is just cranking up. I'm especially in, I like F1, I like the Indy cars the best, NASCAR's already going. Basketball, you know, we're really cooking now, NCAA tournament. I'm going to watch those things till the day I die. I am even, I was in Colorado last week, I'll be in Spain and Portugal a week from today, talking about all these kind of ideas. And wherever I go, I got in my calendar, when are the races? When are the basketball games? I'm going to be getting on, I, actually I got to sign up and take my droid to the global one so I can check the basketball scores from Portugal. Um, I didn't pick either one of those. Those will be with me till the day I die. And if you call somebody in your Australian affiliate or something, they say, I can't come to the office today, I got a test. You don't know what's going on until you find out. Well, cricket. And it's a, a test. It's like a, whatever, eight day match or whatever, and the whole country shuts down. And geography is so important, and we are losing that. If you go back to my old Fortune magazines in the 1930s, really right up to the 1960s, Fortune's always been a big place for institutional advertising, um, big corporations, you know, bragging about themselves. And in there, um, those old ads would 80, 90% of the time would tell where the company was headquartered. American Express Company, New York, New York, Coca-Cola, Atlanta, Georgia, Ford Motor, Dearborn, Michigan. Less than 15% of the ads today, and for the last 10 or 15 years, ever mention the place. You used to be able to look at the area code, now it's 800 or 866 or whatever, you know. And man, that is so costly. Every time I go to a website, I want to look and see where are they. And if they got a, just a form, email, and the, no address, you know, I need to know where they're coming from. It's going to better inform my thinking and my understanding of their business and their whole mindset. You know, compare Austin to Silicon Valley and, you know, Silicon Alley and uh, Silicon everywhere, you know. Um, and, and so geography is critically important and important to be aware with, of the basic data and the basic information. 90% of the business people on earth cannot tell you the population of the city they live in. So a guy who bids here, some of you already know, some of you have had me in class. What's the population of the Austin metropolitan area? Because I know some of you are from Austin. Sure. The MSA. MSA. MSA, 1.4 million. 1.8. Uh, it was 1.7 one seven, one seven or 1.750 one seven the last time the government published. Good, good. When I say city, I mean metropolitan area. It's five counties here. Um, it's so important to know this stuff and understand how we fit it. So with that context up front, now let me talk about Latin America and Mexico, because for me, Mexico is really a gateway to Latin America. And, and so I'll touch on both of them, but my focus will be on Mexico. So here I am, you know, white boy from Indiana, moved to Texas 28 years ago, picked Austin as the best place in America to start the, the first book superstore because of the, the dynamics of the market for reading. A small enough size I could advertise on radio and TV and newspaper with just one store and come in and dominate the market. The average U.S. bookstore did about a half a million a year in sales and we had to do a million to break even, lower prices, bigger selection. And um, the venture capitalists all laughed at me. My projection was a million four. We opened up the first year, did a million eight. And the next door to us, two doors down, was the second Whole Foods market. And I later served for five years on their board of directors. So I watched them grow from 10 million to 8 billion or so. Um, I picked Austin, came down, people say, oh, go try Mexican food. I actually remember the first time uh, uh, one of the Mexican-American women in my college dorm uh, said, oh, mom's going to come cook, you know, from the west side of Chicago, the uh, Mexican neighborhoods. And, you know, I'm looking at this green stuff, some vegetable or fruit, we're not sure what, mixed up. Am I really going to try that, you know? No, nah, I can't go more than about six hours without avocado. Um, you know, I have a friend of mine called from New York and said, oh, let's go to Mexico City. This is 24, five years ago, 25, I guess. Well, kind of like, well, why do you want to go to Mexico City? I've been living in Austin three years. I haven't been really impressed. Mexico, Mexican people. I mean, not unimpressed, but 
I mean, neutral, let's say, at best. And oh yeah, let's go see Mexico City. Well, since then I've gotten out of the house, which I urge all of you to do, whether that's to go to the little town down the road from your, your company or where you live, or the city in your state you know nothing about, or the other side of the globe. I've been to 41 countries, um, and I started going to Mexico more often, really the last 10 years. And I've begun to see a place that it seems like very, very few Americans know about. How many of you have been to Mexico? Okay, and I'm gonna ask, now how many of you have only been to one of the beach locations when you went to Mexico? Well, see, you're a rare crowd, <laughs> I can tell you, from being in the travel business. Most Americans go to Mexico if they know it. How many of you have been to Mexico City? How many of you have been to Monterey? Yeah, you know, I was thinking about that when I was making my notes here and stuff, is when I say, okay, well, who's going to come to a meeting why Mexico will change your life? It's going to be a bunch of people that already believe in Mexico or, or are seriously interested in learning more. The people we've got to get to, not me, we've got to get to are all those other people out here at this thing that have only been to Cancun or Acapulco or Cabo or whatever. And I'm not knocking any of those places. Beaches are great. I love tourism. So here's my take on Mexico, and it sure looks to me like you're a, you're a pretty sophisticated crowd, so hopefully we'll have a lively discussion after I get through a few remarks here. Mexico is going to change the life of every person in the United States, whether they're in this room or not. You can present a wide range of scenarios. I, I took the bus to Mexico City from Austin in mid-January, 22-hour bus ride from here, change it Laredo over to Nuevo Laredo, and then the luxury bus with the free Wi-Fi and all that, the next 14 hours down into the world's largest bus station, the Norte bus station, Mexico City. I spent six days there, two days meeting with economists, political scientists, authors, people that study the future of Mexico, and four days walking around by myself, taking pictures. I'd take pictures everywhere I go. Um, Mex and I tried to piece it all together. I reread all of my notes yesterday from all the meetings I had, like six or seven people, including the former ambassador to the UN and their chief negotiator for NAFTA, an amazing group of people uh, that I met um, through a, a, a woman in Austin, uh, Elena Escalante, has a business to help Mexican companies do business in the States and vice versa. And she, her, she came from there and, and she showed me around and introduced me to all these people. It was wonderful. Um, Let's go to the negative side. Let's, let's listen to Fox News or whatever, or even CNN on this, on this issue. They aren't really all that different. You, you, if you go to the very worst possible case, um, well, let's step back. One thing, the U.S. is going to become a Latin country. Uh, a lot of the groups I speak to are undergraduates. If they're going to become entrepreneurs, most of their life is going to be shaped by being in a largely Latin country. Between 2010 and 2050, the number of white non-Hispanics in America goes from 200 million 500,000, 200 comma 500, give or take, to 201 million. 0.2 percent increase in the number of white non-Hispanics total in the United States population. And that's using conservative estimates from the Census Bureau, and this assumes low rates of migration because they got higher rates of migration modeling too. This is the low rate model. In that low rate model, the number of Hispanics, the way the Census Bureau defines it, goes from something like 50 million to 125 million. It's up 74 million against the other groups up 500,000. Think about the implication of that for schooling, because those are young, there's a lot of youth in there, you know? Our grade schools are not going to have a lot of white guys, you know, and on a rally basis. And it used to be Texas, obviously, we were part of Mexico before we were part of the United States, and California, and the whole thing. Um, but every state in the United States, as I understand it, having double checked these numbers, has at least 10,000 Mexican Americans in it, even North Dakota and everything. Fastest growing group all over the United States. And Latinos of all, I have lots of friends from Colombia, I meet more and more people from Chile. I taught 3,000 students in Guatemala City last year. So it's more than that, but obviously uh, Mexico is the single biggest piece. So first of all, they're our neighbors. They share a deep cultural historical heritage, and, and I'm a globalist. I, well, uh, Jim and I and, and another friend of ours went to Thailand last year in Russia. I love all these places. And when I made my money on Bookstop, first thing I did, I went around the world and I spent a week in a Buddhist city, a week in a Hindu city, and a week in a Muslim city. But nevertheless, hey, I go into big church. You go to Mexico City, it's probably the most church-going place on earth. You know, everybody's in a big Catholic church. Well, that kind of feels like Boston and Chicago, you know. So there are connections there that I think are worth doing. But above all, there are neighbors. Okay. Scenarios for Mexico, the bad scenario, it becomes a failed state. I got a list here, oh, I, I didn't, uh, they're in the folder here somewhere. 
uh, um, one of the economists I talked to, he went through all the states of Mexico that were, you know, that have 31 states. I've been to 11 of them. Um, that are within the states are failed states, where the governor basically reports to the drug cartels. The treasury, the taxation system is up to the drug cartels. There are a bunch of other states that are not, that are the opposite, that are fine and clean and everything, and, uh, and then there's some states in the middle. A nation can become what political scientists call a failed state. Afghanistan is one. Colombia was pretty much there for a while. Peru was pretty much there, although last year Peru had the fastest growing economy in the Western Hemisphere, something like 9%. It's come back, as has Colombia. They're kicking butt and taking names. You can make a case Mexico becomes a failed state. And, and the way to define that might be, oh, the president of the country is not allowed in certain states. He'd be killed if he went in the states, and there's no way to protect him. That's a good sign you live in a failed state. Pakistan, you know? That could happen. That is not impossible. If that happens, you're going to have 20, 30 million people coming across that border. I don't care what kind of walls you built. I don't care how many submarines you got out there. You with me? I mean, if that happens, that will be, that will just make Iraq and Afghanistan look like fourth page news or tenth page news. A, a, an unsuccessful Mexico is the worst possible thing that could happen to the United States of America. So even if you don't give a rat's ass about Latin America and you don't care about Mexico, you got to have an interest in it and care about it. What's the other scenario? The scenario I see and I have to tell you that overall I am a, at least a little more optimistic than most of the Mexican people I meet. And let me say, do not deny the reasons they're afraid. Deaths are real, violence is real, the drug wars are real. Okay, and, and it would be wrong to deny those. And when I took that bus ride from Austin to Mexico City, I can assure you, I went, the State Department keeps records on what's the cause of death of Americans if they die of non-natural causes, not a disease, each country, what date, and where they died. So in Mexico, in the first half of 2010, that was the most recent data I had when I did the research, what's the number one cause of Americans dying in Mexico of non-natural causes? Guess? Bus crashes. That's... Uh, accidents are second, uh, a third. All types of accidents are third. Buses and car accidents and things, or stepping in traffic in the wrong place. Any other guesses? What are the top two? Crime. What? Crime, violent. Uh, homicide is fourth. Number one is drowning. Alcohol and beaches. They do wonders. <laughs> Number two is suicide. And all I can figure on that, I hate to say it here in this building, is I, after my life in tourism, I believe that hotels are, are, are a, a leading place where people commit suicide. They leave all their friends and relatives and go off to some deserted place and, you know, end it. So, so homicide's fourth. And there were none in Mexico City in the first half of 2010. According to the State Department, they don't have all the data. It's a good, pretty good start. To me, it's like a sample. I don't believe they, they have all, all the numbers perfect with all the issues that exist in police reporting around the world. So be aware of all that. But the Mexico that I see, well, first of all, let's deal with those problems. The first thing, those kind of issues do not last. The drug wars, the cartels controlling a big, the whole northern part of the country and stuff. That is unsustainable in any economic or business analysis, because it's a business, it's an economic thing. I, as a person who, four, three of my teachers at the University of Chicago won Nobel Prizes in economics, they and I are all free market believers. Uh, and I can, Milton Friedman was the first major Nobel Prize winner I ever met and said that they ought to, we ought to decriminalize uh, drugs in America. We had prohibition in the 20s, and we had blood running in the streets of Chicago. We have prohibition today. We have blood running in the streets of Juarez. We just don't learn, at least in that case. And there are others, too. And, and you know, we've got policies here that are just doing the same thing we did in the 1920s. Nothing is new. It all happens over and over. So I, and there's part of it. The other thing is it's just not sustainable. And you can paint, and I've met enough Mexican thinkers and everything, a range of ways that the drug wars will end in Mexico. One is the Colombian route, where basically the government won, you know? They pounded them into the dirt, and they won. And, and working hard with the U.S. and a lot of different issues. And now, you know, Colombia's really, you know, a lot of the stuff's still grown there, but nobody's getting killed there, it gets shipped out. So some sort of system like that, or, and there are people that believe that if the PRI, the old big party in Mexico, wins in 2012, you know, they elect a president every six years, 2012 is the next one, a lot of the people down there think that they will, would reach accommodation with the drug lords. And go around and say, oh, you got Sinaloa, and you got this, and we'll stay out of your hair, you stay out of ours, stop killing people, uh, you know, and stop killing each other, and go about your business. A lot of different ways it can roll out, but come on. Vietnam was an absolute basket case in the 60s. 
The United States was a basket case in the 1860s. We just killed 800,000 of our friends and neighbors, right? Colombia, uh, there was no hope for Colombia as recently as five or six years ago. Panama, we went in and ran the guy out, right? We, we went, ran into a church and they played music he didn't like until he went crazy and Noriega had to come out of the church, you know? Um, every country on earth goes through this kind of a birthing, a rebirthing process. There is enough violence and bad leadership throughout Latin America to last them thousands of years. But they've already had that, you know? When I was in Brazil, they said, look, Brazil has the greatest potential of any country in the world. It always has and it always will. <laughs> they really saw no future. Well, hey, that was 10 years ago. It's all different now. Fastest growing airliner maker in the world, Embraer. Fastest growing airline in the world, Azul. They are cooking and, and cooking sugar ethanol. You know, they're no longer dependent upon foreign energy. Um, huge rise in agriculture all over Latin America. Where Brazil is kind of the model. Chile, uh, amazing country. If you look at any measure of freedom and progress. And it, it was not a sweet place under Pinochet. You know, they still, in Chile and Argentina, march in the streets over all the teenagers and college kids that disappeared into torture places and jails and never were found. Things change. And if you look at things week to week to week, you ain't going to see it. You look at things year to year, five years, ten years, you're going to see it. The things today facing Mexico are not going to be there in 10 or 15 years. They are unsustainable. I'm actually more concerned about things like earthquakes and I mean the poor Japanese now and volcanoes but we got some of it we don't have volcanoes we got the earthquake issue on the whole left coast of the US and actually the most prone earthquake place in America is around St. Louis uh, Cape Girardeau fault and all that you know I can't do anything about those none of us can uh, one of my favorite countries on earth Indonesia it looked like its economy was totally going to implode and everything I got that puppy turned around it is really booming now but they got a lot of volcanoes so That'll pass. What will Mexico be like when it comes out of all this? From just, again, a self-interested business person's viewpoint. It's 112 million people today. In 2050, it's going to be 150 million. It is going to have this huge, massive middle class. The, uh, did I write my numbers down? The uh, telephone usage is here somewhere. Um, okay, uh, people with credit cards in Mexico, just between 2002 and 2009, went from 6 million to 25 million. Since 1960, the life expectancy of men has gone from 56 to 73, of women from 60 to 78. Percent from 1970, it's gone from 42% of Mexican households had electricity to 97%. Home ownership's up to 79%. Uh, yeah, um, I can go on and on. I always got numbers. It's going to have this huge middle class. And a key thing is the dependency ratio. That's a ratio of the number of people that are working to the ones that aren't in any given society. The U.S. is about to go down, right? We're going to have all these old baby boomers retired who vote many, many more times, you know, a much higher percentage of 80-year-olds than 70-year-olds vote, 70 than 60, 60 than 50, 50 than 40, 40 than 30, and nobody in their 20s votes. And if you just look at total numbers, presidential election stuff, they came out in 08, but they still were no, low numbers compared to those other age groups. And we'll see if they come back again. <sighs> All this old time, hey, uh, you know, going to be unlikely to give up on our Social Security or cut back on it. It's going to be too late politically. We're going to have a rising number of people dependent upon that whole entitlement system and a shrinking number of people paying into it. And to the extent that Gates and Buffett and everybody give all their money to nonprofits, that takes more enterprises and more jobs off the tax base, right, as far as those enterprises not paying federal income tax. Get on all of that. I, I, I gave away more money than I kept for myself to my beloved University of Chicago. So I believe in charity. But well, we got a lot of things going against us in this country. You know, we have a shortage of people who are working ages. And it's going to get worse and worse and worse on a relative basis. What's the story in Mexico and all Latin America? The exact opposite. Just cooking right into that curve. That same curve that was a key factor in the U.S.'s overall economic growth from, the, from World War II to today. Big rising middle class, age 22 to 45, or however you want to define it. Not that many retired people. For, and if you want to get into a thing about the Western Hemisphere versus Europe and against Asia, I like all those places, so I'm a little reticent to get too far in that. But I tell you, if you, if you, if you are worried about, oh, Asia's going to rule, and let's face it, there, what's going to go on in China and India? What's already going on? But give it 30 or 40 years, it's, it's just going to blow everybody's minds. And all these big U.S. companies are going to be divisions of Chinese companies and stuff. It's happening. But if you want the Western Hemisphere to be competitive, if you want the United States to be competitive, a key part of that success is likely to be our connection with Latin America. Young. 
uh, muscle and working people if you want to manufacture stuff. If you're going to have to make something overseas, and, and let's face it, that's, nothing's going to change that or turn back that clock. You're about to build a plant in China or Taiwan or Malaysia. Stop and think. What can I find in Mexico? Chrysler, Volkswagen, their highest quality plant, no, Chrysler's highest quality plant in the Western Hemisphere is Toluca, Mexico. Volkswagen is doing all their production down there. Uh, going back to auto country back in Indiana, over and over, executives say, look, we get higher quality products out of Mexico than we get out of China and out of Korea. It has this highly educated workforce, hard work. And work. I met a guy yesterday at a, a great conference, uh, IT, uh, America's IT Forum, that uh, just took place for the first time here uh, uh, the day before yesterday. And I uh, met a guy, an Indian guy, who was doing like outsourcing to India, to his home country. He's moved it all to Guadalajara. He said the, co the labor costs are the same, the quality of the work is the same, and it's a, a $300 airplane ticket instead of a $3,000 airplane ticket. You know. And he went way down the list of why he is moving all his, and he's an Indian, you know, Indian, Indian <laughs> heritage guy. That country is going to be so amazing in 20 years. And all the Mexican people who are scared, and you know, let's face it, if you're wealthy and you're worried about your kids being kidnapped, they're moving to Austin. They've been moving to Houston and Miami, San Antonio for years, but now Austin's becoming a hot center. And I, I can't sit there and look some guy in the eye and say, you shouldn't have left Mexico, you know, because you've got four teenage kids and you don't want them getting a phone call when they get home from work that they didn't make it to school. I understand all that. I don't think for the average person, I can assure you in Mexico City, and I, I, hey, I lived in Chicago in the 60s, New York in the 70s, I've been all over the world, poor countries, rich countries, Calcutta, walking the streets. Mexico City is one of the safer cities I've been in. It is certainly safer than Washington, D.C., and it's safer than a lot of other U.S. cities. And I never, and I have eyes in the back of my head, going to school in the ghetto of Chicago in the 60s. I think I was mugged four times just trying to get a bachelor's degree. Uh, I have eyes in the back of my head. I know when somebody's watching me. I know when I was in the Rome train station with my luggage and all my electronics and video cameras and all that shit, you know, I, there were like four sets of eyes on me. Every move I made, you know, in the Rome train station. I zoomed in on the highest seat, the Pendolino train down out of Florence. Five days walking the streets of Mexico City with video, digital cameras and everything. Never. There was never a person looking at me. And never a person following me. Uh, and I'm saying they don't have crime. Look up the numbers. They have crime. It's a big city. It's one of the three giant cities of the Western Hemisphere. The other two being, they're all 18 to 20 million for the metro area. Guesses on the other two? Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo and New York City. Still number one by most measures. The best source for really good apples to apples population numbers on big metropolitan areas is a site called demographia.com. The UN and stuff can't really keep up with it. It's a huge challenge because no two countries measure the suburbs the same way and it really takes an independent mind to step them back. You can't just take government data on what's the population of Shanghai from China because that could be 400 miles out whereas it might be 14 miles out in Phoenix or something. This guy, he puts it all together. So I like his, I use his numbers. Mexico, uh, it's this huge market and it's this huge, it's a place we should sell things to and a place we should buy things from. And, uh, and I know there's a huge amount of controversy about NAFTA. There's not a lot of controversy among economists. The, the best numbers I've found is that, well, for Mexico, their exports have increased, are like 40% uh, higher than they would have been without NAFTA. And I, and I believe the United States as well. So I, I believe free trade is the greatest force on earth for peace. When you're trading with a country, you just are much, much less likely to bomb them or them to bomb you. And the more we can trade, and I mean trade in capital, trade in people, migration, trade in ideas, trade in religions, trade in products, most important of all, the real growth of futures, trade in services. Software, consulting, transportation services, brain stuff, the stuff that America is great at because with our entrepreneurial culture, that is one thing where the United States is like, if Paris is a place for perfume and Bollywood is a place for movies, you know, it's going to be, hey, the place for entrepreneurial energy, for diversity, for creativity, for making music, for making movies, they're all learning, they're all getting better. I mean, Brazilian music will blow you away if you haven't gotten into it, but the United States is still the nation's treasure chest. And so I believe that exporting, that's why I I speak in Mexico and stuff and wherever they want me all over the world about entrepreneurial ideas. Um, 
Go to Mexico, some of the things about it, they, are, they have a much lower uh, government burden on their society than we do. About 20% of their total economy goes into government. I, I forgot, I was going to look ours up, I think we're about 35% or something. When you have federal, state, local and everything. Most of growth has been state and local, not federal. Uh, so they have a much lower drain on their productive energy. They actually are investing more in capital than the United States is the last year or two, according to these reference books that I use. Um, and I, and I brought these to show you. This is the, the Bible for understanding the world. I'll talk about it more in a minute or when you come up afterwards. Um, they, uh, when I go down there, everybody is in university. What's their tertiary enrollment? India, 13% of the people of college age are in college. China, 22%. World average, 26%. Uh, and I think Mexico is like 28. Latin America is 35 percent, goes as high as 50 percent in Chile and 68 percent in Argentina. I was looking at internal renewable fresh water per capita. How much water they got? Big factor going forward. India, 1,100 cubic meters per person. China, 2,100. U.S., 9,000. Latin America overall average 24,000, peaking at 57,000 in Peru and 53,000 in Chile. The only place on earth they got 50 times as much water as India per capita in, in, in uh, Peru and in Chile, and 20 times as much as China. So much going for these people. They have been so held back by bad leadership, by corruption, by socialism. The only country in Latin America that ain't cooking is Venezuela. In 2011, the U.S. GDP, gross domestic product, will grow 1.5%. Mexico will grow double that, 3%. Chile will go almost double that, 5.7%. Venezuela, negative 2.5%. And you know, they are, in terms of oil, energy, they are the richest country in Latin America. And they've completely destroyed it through political idiocy. Um, Here's an interesting one. Economic freedom. Go to the Index of Economic Freedom book. Comes out every year. A new one just came out. The U.S. is ninth in the world. Tops. The way they rank them. Based really on, are you, is your business world free? And can you trade with each other? And, and ninth. Chile is 11th, right on our heels. India and China are like 125th, 130th. Ahead of India and China are Chile, El Salvador, Peru, Colombia, Mexico, Costa Rica, Panama, Paraguay, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Honduras, and Brazil. You know, I go on and on with numbers. I won't bore you with all those. The thing is, that country, and everybody's in university, and they're building their infrastructure. That's where that capital is going. They're building toll roads all over that country. India, man, I, and it's been a few years since I went to Calcutta and Mumbai, but it was almost like a gravel road going down to the Mumbai airport. Now, I'm sure that's improved, but they are way behind the eight ball in their infrastructure. Brazil, as hot as it is in every regard, uh, they still have trouble getting agricultural products out of the interior. It can take them like, you know, eight days to get out to a port because the roads are bad. It ain't the true case in Mexico. They're running, I saw in the Mopac, our big railroad runs right here through Austin, a ma National de Mexico uh, locomotive leading the people through, uh, leading the train through. That, that wasn't going on five years ago. I'm a student of the railroad industry. There are so many things happening. And, and the other thing, so all I've said so far is even if you don't care at all about Mexico 